Sen dan kom op, sen dan je deze doen en met jou een vuurling is gedaan. Ja, kom, sen dan kom, en probeer die m***en. Graduating high school and taking the first steps into college is a big event in many people's lives. For the first time, they are on their own, preparing to build the foundational steps for their career. With this big change of setting comes a need for belonging. Some may fill this need by joining activities or clubs, but some of the strongest bonds are created in fraternities. Of course, to prove yourself to the group, new members are often required to undergo a hazing ritual. This hazing almost always includes the new members doing extremely unpleasant activities, to put it lightly. Although most universities do not condone hazing, this doesn't stop fraternities from doing them anyway. One of the most disturbing hazing rituals recorded occurred at the University of Leuven in Belgium in 2018 and took the life of a student named Sanda Dia. Sanda Dia was a 20-year-old student at the University of Leuven studying engineering. In 2018, he decided to join the fraternity there known as Roizaham. Although the hazing rituals there were known to be harsh, he likely thought it couldn't possibly be that bad. December 4th was the day his initiation into the fraternity began. Sanda, along with two other potential members, were informed about the events that were going to take place. The initiation would consist of a series of tasks, followed by a quote-unquote baptism that they need to participate in the next day. Their first task was to enter the streets of Leuven, dressed as apostles, carrying a pack of roses. Their goal was to try and sell the roses to people passing by. There was a special incentive here, however, as they were told that whoever sold the most roses would be spared from the next day's baptism. This first task wasn't bad at all, but this was only the start to what would become a horrific event. After the rose selling task was completed, they moved on to task number two. This included them drinking copious amounts of alcohol until they hit the floor. The night was spent downing bottles of liquor until they were inebriated to the point of blacking out. A video that was later recovered from that night, timestamped at 11.39pm, shows two of these potential members being urinated on while lying on the floor. After this night of debauchery, these people were brought back to their living quarters to sleep. As they lay in their intoxication into slumber, the members of Roizaham overseeing the initiation taped up all the water taps so they would not be able to hydrate themselves in the morning to help with their hangover. The next morning, they woke up, nauseated and tired, being pulled to their next task, the baptism. This surveillance footage shows a sickly looking Sanda Dia being pulled through the streets. They brought him and the other potential members into the backseat of a car, where they were driven 50 kilometers out to a log cabin in the woods of Vorsalar. On the way, the fraternity members make a stop to purchase some items needed for the night's events. CCTV footage shows them buying live mice, cockroaches, worms, and crickets. And according to the shopping receipt, they bought a lot of other strange ingredients too, including shrimp paste, hot sauce, and fish oil. When they arrived at the cabin, the three potential recruits were each told to dig a hole in the ground. Sanda must have really not been feeling well from the night before, as he was very noticeably struggling to dig. At this time, this text message exchange occurred between two of the Roizaham members. How is the baptism? Updates? Newcomers are starting to shovel. Sanda is already ready for the rubbish bin. The other two are still okay. After the hole was finally dug, they filled it with ice cold water and made the newcomers sit in it. While sitting in this makeshift well, shivering through the night, they were periodically brought a special porridge that they were forced to drink. This concoction consisted of all the gross ingredients shown on that receipt we looked at earlier. After they were done choking down this vomit-inducing drink, they were forced to swallow a live goldfish and then regurgitate it back up by drinking a large amount of fish oil. Finally, they were all instructed to bite the head off a dead mouse. But the night isn't over yet. The next part of the ritual was for these new members to have buckets of cold water poured on them until they were told they could leave the hole. The first two members were told they could leave, but they still weren't finished with Sanda. After a while, Sanda was given permission to exit the hole, but he appears to be unresponsive. They eventually had to pull him out of the hole themselves. After which, Sanda lied on the ground, shaking in a fetal position. 
At this point, it took them nearly two hours to conclude that something was seriously wrong and he needed medical help. But they were afraid of calling for help as the current scene clearly puts them in a bad light. In a desperate attempt to save themselves from any sort of responsibility, they frantically refilled the hole, cleaned everything up in garbage bags, and tried deleting any digital evidence of what occurred that night. Only at this point did they finally begin driving Sanda to the hospital. On the way to the hospital, a Roizahan member called emergency services to report Sanda's condition. <laughs> What they failed to mention on the phone was the reason why Sanda was cold, the amount of alcohol he consumed, and the amount of fish oil and other ingredients they practically force fed him. At a quarter past 9 p.m., Senda arrived at the hospital where he fell into a coma. It was discovered that he suffered from a cardiac arrest as well as hypothermia. His body temperature was down to about 34 degrees Fahrenheit. On December 7th, Sanda Dia passed away in the hospital from multiple organ failure. The coroner attributed his passing to salt toxicity from the amount of fish oil he consumed. The amount of salt in his body was comparable to a person who drank one gallon of salt water. This caused acute cerebral edema, or swelling of the brain. What makes this event way more devastating than it already was, is how easy the fraternity members involved in this got off. Initially, the only thing that happened to them was that the fraternity was disbanded and the students involved had to do some community service and write a paper on the history of hazing. This seems like an incredibly mild punishment for people that were involved in the taking of someone's life. And the school did get a bit of backlash for this, leading them to release a statement saying that these students would be denied access to university buildings, resulting in them only being allowed to take online classes for the first semester of the year. In 2021, the school released a final statement saying they would enact further disciplinary action on seven of the 18 students involved in this. Those students were expelled and disallowed from registering at the university again for several years, or in some cases, ever again. This still doesn't feel like justice, but keep in mind, this was still under investigation and hadn't gone to court yet. It wasn't until May of this year that a court decision was finally made. The 18 students involved in the horrible event were each found guilty of involuntary manslaughter and degrading treatment. So perfect, maybe we can finally see some justice being served. Well, not exactly. The only penalty they were given was being fined 400 euros each and given 200 to 300 hours of community service. In addition, they also had to pay damages to Santa's family, including 15,000 euros to Santa's father, 8,000 euros to his brother, 6,000 euros to his stepmother, and 1 euro to his mother. This was by her request. Yeah, this still feels like it wasn't harsh enough. I get that the people involved were young but you don't need to be particularly wise to understand the danger of what they were doing. The prosecutors involved in the case wanted jail sentences for these people, looking specifically for convictions between 18 to 50 months. It was later reported in the media that the reason these students got such a lenient punishment was because some of these fraternity members were the sons of judges, business leaders, and politicians. In response to this news, protests erupted all throughout Belgium, seeking justice for Sanda Dia. There was a mural painted in his memory, and people painted these words in a nearby building, which translates to F. Reusaham. The protest even spread to the Netherlands, near the Belgian embassy. There has also been a lot of speculation as to whether or not Sanda's demise had anything to do with racism, seeing as he was the only black student that participated in this particular hazing. At first, I didn't want to jump to any conclusions, but after looking at the evidence, it would be really difficult to deny that race was almost certainly a factor here. There were reports from people at the university of some of these fraternity members calling Sanda the N-word. The chairman of one of the student umbrella organizations said that there were several racist remarks made toward him, including people saying that Sanda had to serve the white people as a black. For God's sake, there's even an old picture of one of the fraternity members involved in this event wearing a KKK costume at a party. 
It is inarguable that at least some of these fraternity members were definitely racist. During the investigation of this case, a video was found on one of their fraternity members' phones that dated to just one month after Santa's passing. The video depicted them harassing a homeless person of African descent, singing things like, Cut your hands, the Congo is ours. This is one of the most tragic, sickening cases I've talked about, and it's infuriating that the people responsible for Santa Dia's fate have experienced very little consequences for their actions. They clearly exhibited no signs of remorse for their actions, as every step of the way they only focus on trying to save themselves instead of actually facing what they did. Maybe if they actually gave a shit about what happened, they would have driven Santa to the hospital immediately instead of spending hours cleaning up the evidence while Santa was literally dying. In my opinion, these people are a danger to society and have a long way to go before earning anyone's forgiveness. Thank you for watching, and I will see you on the flip side.